Yes, sir. Here we are on a given Monday morning, 12 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. Here on Marco and me, sometimes Mina Marco and me, on energy. And Marco Mangelsdorf joins us by Skype audio from the Big Island, from ProVision Solar in Hilo, Hawaii. Welcome back. Welcome to the show, Marco. From Enchanted Monday, I will find my J. Fidel. Of course you I will. will find my J. Fidel across cyberspace. Welcome, <laughs> Jay. Thank you for having me back. Okay, we got a we got a big agenda for this show. Let's start out with the solar scene. You uh, presented a couple times at a conference at the Hilton Wine Village last week in the EUCI. What did you tell them then? You remember back in the so-called old days, Jay, when before we had uh, GPS and satellites showing this beautiful blue orb known as the planet Earth, there was a fear that the ancient mariners had that if they sailed too far off into the dis distance, they may fly out, fall, literally fall off the edge of the Earth. <laughs> I don't have personal recollection, but I'm sure it's, it went just that way. <laughs> I know it was a little bit before your time and my time. But my impression right now is that uh, we in the renewable energy business and solar energy industry business are coming uh, are kind of metaphorically in that uh, terra incognita, which is actually changing metaphors because that's uh, you know, unknown earth. But we're really in uncharted waters here. I'll stay with my oceanic mariner metaphor here as far as what comes next and the fact that we're the first state in the country to really make uh, the significant break or change from PV systems, renewable energy systems, rooftop solar, uh, that are export-based where the customer generator, the person having the system on their roof or their facility, uh, can get some type of credit value for exported uh, kilowatt hours, surplus kilowatt hours. And we're transitioning from that, which has served us all very well for the past 15 or so years, to one that is self-consumption based where no export energy is allowed into the grid, which requires battery storage, which we're just kind of on the beginning of the uh, Dorothy in Munchkin land of the Yellow Brick Road. Uh, we're, we're starting on this long journey, and we know we eventually want to get to Emerald City, which has uh, low-cost, uh, reliable energy storage, but we're going to have to go through haunted forests. You should and probably uh, show the slide, the appropriate off. slide. Don't we, don't we have a slide of Dorothy? I mean, Dorothy is relevant in so many circumstances. Let's see Dorothy. Well, Dorothy, of course, was accompanied by her very trusty four-legged friend, Toto. So I think, uh, is, uh, m again, metaphorically speaking, uh, if we're going to take the Dorothy mantle in the PV industry, then we're going to need some trusty helpers along the way, whether from uh, the regulatory side, from the legislature, from other interested parties and, and energy stakeholders here to make this, uh, this challenging and perhaps perilous journey. Well, what's, you know, what, how do you see it, though? I mean, uh, 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 this is after NEM, right? After net energy metering. Now, instead of getting, um, you know, credit, you do it yourself, self-supply. It was kind of waiting in the wings for a long time. And the utility, um, you know, we, I kind of expected it would go this direction. But, you know, there's a lot of applications pending for it. Um, people are interested in it. Um, and the s suppliers are selling it. So uh, what's, what's, um, you know, what's the rub? Is this okay or not? Well, my dear friend, Jay, I think you've taken the bait of some creative headline writers from uh, the Associated Press and also from perhaps our friends at the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Uh, to put it in perspective, the customer self-supply or no export model has been available for about a year now, a little more than a year. Okay. And to date, as of at least, uh, let's say, 10 or 11 days ago, the grand total of all the, the numbers for HECO, HELCO, and NECO, for all three companies, the grand total of all those who applied for customer self-supply was a whopping 342, 342 for all three companies. And by comparison, the average number of PV permits that the City and County Department of Planning and Permitting has been issuing on a monthly basis, on a monthly basis, 400 plus PV permits every month. And here we've got 342 CSS applications for all three companies over the course of more than a year. So what's holding it up? What's holding it up is, uh, is uh, adoption, is interest in the product, and the fact that uh, 
up until a few months ago, we had customer grid supply, which did allow for exported PV power, but albeit at a lower rate than retail. So that clearly uh, was the more attractive option for homeowners who have yet to go PV. They went with CGS, and now CGS is no longer available, and it's unlikely, it appears unlikely, that the commission is going to give us uh, an interim uh, increase in the CGS caps for HECO, HELCO, and MECO, from what I can tell. So the CSS is the only, close to the only option available right Yeah, but now. so, the, and, you know, the, in, in that effect, um, it really works out the same way. You, you produce more power than you need, and then you can use it later. Um, but, you know, that works well. You don't have to buy it from the utility. So the economics... Um, you know, of the, of the daily use of power, they're pretty much the same because you can do the same thing, except that it costs money to buy the storage. And I suggest to you, like your you know, reaction is, it's only money. It's the money to buy the storage system that's holding this up. Am I right? Well, I mean, easy for you to say, my friend, in that... Uh the cost of a PV system without batteries, let's say five kilowatts, the nominal four dollars a watt, just to make the math easy, that's twenty thousand dollars installed. Okay, when you put in adequate, and I'll highlight the word adequate storage for that same five kW system, you are looking at a out the door cost of anywhere from twenty seven, twenty eight thousand, with the lowest cost option, which is right now, from what I can tell, the new Tesla Powerwall, a uh, Powerwall two, it's called. Uh, from 27000 for the lowest cost option to easily more than 40000 coming from another supplier. So when you're going from 20000 without batteries to 27 to 40 plus, I mean, that is not an incremental marginal increase in cost. That's a whack the consumer right between the eyes. And keep in mind, homeowners and consumers, you know, they're very you know, competitive in the sense of they know you know, a cousin or a neighbor or an auntie or, or some type of friend or family member who got a PV system a year, two, three, four years ago and paid that $20,000. And now I come along and say, well, sorry, you can't get what your neighbor got, but boy, do I have a deal for you. It's going to cost you 35000 instead of your neighbor paying twenty. So it, it's a tough sell, Jay. It's a really tough sell right now. Yeah, and, and, that'll, and that'll slow it down to 300 and some odd the way it has. What do you see in the future? Are people... This is their only option. What are they going to do? Are they not going to do it? They're going to forget about solar? Is that what's going to happen? Well, I mean, speaking for myself and my industry, I sure as heck uh, hope that they uh, they decide uh, that they don't decide not to move forward. But I mean, there's going to be an adjustment time, a transition time, which we're just starting in right now, essentially, where the better option, the more cost-effective option, the more affordable option is no longer an option. So now the option remaining is more expensive. So how long is it going to take for those homeowners, those 80% or so of single-family homeowners who don't have solar, for them to, to migrate over to the battery option? And that is going to be heavily influenced by the cost of batteries and by the performance. And again, you look at 342, like I just mentioned, 342 CSS applications uh, across the pipelines, essentially, for the three companies. You know how many of those have actually been installed? A handful. And, uh, given permission to operate? Two. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw that. You know, the interesting thing, though, is that, um, um, that you know, over time, things will change. The cost of batteries likely to go down. Somebody will have a breakthrough, like with graphene, you know, the graphene technology. Uh, and the, the cost of fossil fuel is likely to go up. And when it, go, when it goes up, then, then the, this whole self-supply thing will pencil out better, and some people will be driven to it for the lack of any other option. Jay, I don't disagree with you, but uh, I tell you as a business owner, I have to necessarily be most focused or very focused on what I need to do to keep my doors open, to pay my employees, to pay my bills. In other words, more kind of immediate term cash flow. And I feel very bullish that energy storage will come down dramatically in price. It'll become much more ubiquitous. And once again, Hawaii leading the way and much of the rest of the country will follow over time. But uh, this transition is going to be very painful. And if you have a chance to put on one of my other slides there, I mean, it shows rather graphically what the, uh, what the reduction uh, or the drop of uh, PV permits has been across uh, 
Hawaii uh, 2016 compared to the same period 2015. I mean, it's, it's not trivial in terms of the, the reduced number of sales and reduced number of permits. I mean, 50%, drop of 50% here on this island, 30 plus percent on Oahu and somewhere around a third, 33 plus percent for Maui County. Yeah, let's look at that slide. Is this the one you were referring to? Uh, I'm not seeing it yet oh. on the screen. It's a brave here. new and unsettling post dem CGS world. PV permit numbers down compared to 2015. And it, it shows. Oh, yeah, I see it here. How far yes, down thank it you is. for yeah. showing that. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's truly, you know, kind of alligators waiting there that were afraid to, to fall into that. Uh, Alawai Canal. I know there aren't alligators now in the Alawai. There's pollution, of course, but not alligators. But, uh, I mean, just in point of comparison, compared to the Halcyon days of 2012, I mean, it's down 70%. Yeah. Their PV permit numbers are down 70%. So what's going to happen to the industry? Water. I'm sorry? What's going to happen to the industry? You're suffering. They're all suffering. Is it, you know, we've had shrinkage already in the industry. Uh, th this could be uh, a, a, a mortal blow to the industry, no? Well, that is my concern. That is my concern uh, that uh, we're in this transitional period now. We're all trying to maintain brave, brave fronts and brave faces. And uh, I think, I mean, it's inevitable that if these numbers were to continue, it's going to be a dramatic downsizing of the industry. I mean, there's already a downsizing going on. There are already a number of major players who have left the state or all but left the state so you know who's going to be left standing to to still go after yeah. the remaining it's a real business. shake out. i think it'll come down now one now one of the issues coming up this this coming session is going to be whether to give tax credit for storage and that came up last year but the bill failed some kind of scramble as i recall some kind of inter internecine argument um now it is pro is likely to come up again because it's such you know it's an important bill for everybody involved and uh, the chairs are pretty much the same. Uh, Lorena, uh, Lorena Noe is the chair of um, uh, the Senate Energy Committee, and Chris Lee is the, still the chair of the House uh, Energy Committee. Now, let's see, and their co-chairs are, well, Mike Gabbard is the, is the what, co-chair of the Senate Energy Committee? And vice chair. Vice chair, sorry. And yeah. uh, Nicole um, Lowen. Lowen, Lowen is the vice yeah. chair of the House uh, Energy Committee. So given that, what's going to happen with this bill coming uh, January? I would expect, and I anticipate that there will be a bill, bills introduced on both the House and the Senate side to carve out a specific uh, tax credit, state tax credit for energy storage. And as we know, I mean, I don't have the figure right in front of me, but out of uh, each hundred bills that are introduced at the beginning of the session, it's a teeny, teeny, tiny percentage that actually yeah. make it through the, the entire session. So, I mean, I would hope that there would be support. I know Mina, our friend Mina, uh, takes the view that it's not needed, that essentially, you know, we've already incentivized uh, solar enough in terms of coming out of the general fund. So I certainly respect that position. But, I mean, it really depends, uh, you know, as a legislature and as a society, where is that we want to go here in our state? Are we willing to to have the state step in, at least on a temporary basis, uh, to subsidize uh, the cost of uh, expensive battery storage. Yeah, and on the other, in the same notion, are we willing to stand by while the industry shrinks and, you know, goes off the side and, and uh, solar installations are dramatically reduced, as they have been? So uh, are we willing to sit by and let that happen, essentially? Well, you know, what's interesting, Jay, is... Uh, there was a quote in um, a piece from last week, uh, Katie Mickelseth from Star Advertiser, uh, who talks to uh, Chair Randy Awase fairly frequently, it would seem. And Randy uh, essentially telegraphed uh, what I had already kind of been intuiting, which is that he doesn't feel that the PV industry should be protected at all costs. Now, I'm, I'm not, this is not his words, but his view apparently is more along the lines of, well, you know, it's not just the PV industry that we have to pay attention to. It's also uh, what seems to be hot on their agenda right now, the Commission's agenda, which is uh, Community-Based community Renewable Energy, or Community Solar for short, and that this is something that seems to be uh, of a high-value item 
for them, and it's not necessarily a less, uh, lesser item, lesser value item for me. But the, the the concern I have is that it's going to take a considerable period of time, a year or longer, I'm afraid, before Community Solar actually starts going in and able to benefit those yeah. people who can't have yeah, a system yeah. on their own roof. So it's all well and good to to put a value on Community Solar, but I, uh, you know, what kind of industry are we going to have left? Yeah. in a year or two yeah i, I mean he, i mean he's right it's just a question of timing and degree we need them both uh let's take uh, let's take a short break marco and we'll come back and uh talk some more we'll talk some more about the psip i want to hear about that we'll be right back aloha my name is justini spiritu this is my co-host matthew johnson every thursday at 4 p.m on theme tech we host the hawaii food and farmer series we like to bring in folks from the whole realm of the local food supply and agriculture, anyone working on these issues, any organization or individual that has plans or projects. What kind of people have we had on? Uh, so we've had farmers, we've had chefs, we've had people from government, uh, larger institutions, everyone who's working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So you can see us every Thursday and join the conversation on Twitter, and we hope to see you there. Slide three, okay, we're going to come back on slide, slide three, and we're back. Slide three and four. We're going to talk about slide three and four. We're going to talk about uh, solar scale, uh, uh, I mean, utility scale solar on Kauai. So Marco, uh, Let's, let's look at slides uh, three and four, and you can talk about, you know, what the situation is on Kauai. Well, it's really exciting what the folks at the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative are doing, I think, in terms of taking the lead, not just in our state, but also nationally, with not just talking about, but actually integrating utility scale battery storage. And they are going to be, in slide three, you'll see, or people will see, that they are moving forward with their fifth utility scale PV plant of a megawatt or larger. And this next one, the one that's going in right now, in fact, that photo is in, it's a photo of the actual array that's being installed right mm -hmm. now, will be uh, 17 megawatts uh, worth of, uh, of PV. Uh, and the, the neat thing is that uh, over 50, there will be over 50 megawatt hours of, of storage, and dispatchable storage. And what that means is that when the sun goes down, some of the batteries which will have been charged during the day, during daylight hours, will be providing power to uh, to people when the sun goes down. And I see you put on the next slide, but that's not the not the next slide I wanted to see. Okay, you put on slide four. Slide please. four, yeah. Then, that's not it either. Okay. Well, um, so, you know, the bottom line here is that uh, KIUC, as is often the case, is very creative and somehow gets the job done uh, and it's getting the job done on utility scale solar and maybe we should be watching to see how well they do uh, as a solution or here's the uh, you, you let's see utility scale um, this is the same slide as before the KIUC slide yeah oh here's here's the one okay we have some construction uh, photos and I guess this yeah, is happening so shows, in Hawaii. It, it shows what's actually going in right now. These are the Tesla Power Pack batteries. They're called Power Packs, and they're 210 kilowatt hours each. So they're going to have more than 200 of them there on these concrete pads, and then in, 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 uh, and enclosed. So it's um, one of the first uh, utility-scale dispatchable systems that Tesla Energy is doing, and, and they're doing it with KIUC. So it's uh, just really exciting, and I and I, I look forward to. Uh, uh, hearing how the, how the system actually operates as uh, you know, this little utility company in the Middle Pacific on um, the Garden Isle is, is leading the way as far as uh, innovative design and uh, and uh, and new products to take us where we want to go. Yeah, but uh, you know, you were talking a minute ago about the, the demise of uh, rooftop solar, um, and that means residential roo rooftop solar mostly. And how this utility scale solar is pretty attractive, and we are making progress. That doesn't help the rooftop uh, problem, does it? No, it doesn't, Jay, but I mean, uh, I'm trying to take a bigger picture here as well, and not just me, 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 and my company, my company, my company, and my industry, but also understanding that, as I've said 
for quite a while. It's going to take a mix or should take a mix of more uh, cheaper utility scale solar, which is uh, at least to date cheaper on a per kilowatt per kilowatt hour basis mm-hmm. compared to rooftop mm-hmm. solar. Take a mix of utility scale and rooftop. Mm-hmm. What that mix should be is in the eye of the mixer, I guess. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, utility scale solar doesn't help me, but it helps us collectively. Mm-hmm. Well, that leads right to the next question, which is the uh, power supply improvement plan, which is supposed to be filed by uh, Hawaiian Electric by uh, December 23rd, coming soon uh, with the PUC. There have been three previous uh, plans submitted, none of which have been approved. And now the question is, what will this plan say? We do have a, a view, of a vision of what it will say, because it's been discussed, and uh, how it will fare at the PUC. So what's happening? Well, the, uh, the Hawaiian Electric Companies have had, I think it's uh, reasonable to say, a, a challenging time uh, in terms of giving their, their game plan uh, in order to improve the power supply and improve it in terms of reliability, but also phase out uh, combustion fossil fuel based generation and phase in uh, renewable energy over time to get to the uh, the Emerald City uh, goal of uh, 45 2045 where we're 100 percent renewable in terms of power generation and this essentially will be the fourth iteration of them putting forward their strategic plan to the Commission the first one being the last uh, IRP or integrated resource plan that morphed to the PSIP, the Power Supply Improvement Plan. So there was IRP. The last IRP was found lacking by the commission. The first PSIP was found lacking by the commission. The second PSIP was found lacking by the commission. And then we're on to PSIP 3 now, or I should say Hawaiian Electric is, and it's due to the commission after I think it was a three-week extension is due by the 23rd of, of December. And... I know my Hawaiian Electric friends have been working their collective okoles off to to get this uh, ready for prime time and submit it to the commission, and and uh, it's going to be up to uh, Randy Iwase and Tom Gorak and Lorraine Akiba and their staff to determine whether uh, PCIF 3 is uh, is adequate, and, and if it's not, then what? I mean, did they tell Hawaiian Electric to, to go for a PCIF 4, which is the fifth iteration, or do they take more, more dramatic, kind of hands-on uh, uh, action in terms of uh, stepping in and doing and taking on more of a uh, oversight or management role? Well, couldn't I, they I do? They know. have the, the authority to that. do that, couldn't they? They could say, "Well, we like this, but we're going to change this part and that part, and and uh, we'll 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 draft the final form if you don't mind." They could do that, right? I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm not enough of a regulatory historian to know kind of where the boundaries are. But uh, you know, in my experience uh, of 16 plus years, decades actually here in Hawaii, in terms of being an energy player, uh, it, it seems to me that this uh, commission has been uh, very active in in an uh, oversight uh, role for the Hawaiian Electric Companies and. Uh, you know, what what the next step is with this commission? I mean, PUCs aren't aren't meant to to actually engage in day to day ops uh, decisions with the utility company. I mean, they're the regulatory body, right? Mm-hmm. But if at a certain time uh, they reach a consensus that uh, that more uh, proactive, uh, hands on uh, uh, behavior is needed on that part on on, on their part, then perhaps that's in the wings. I mean, but I, I just don't know, yeah. Jay, and I'm not suggesting. That I, I do know, but I, you know, there's there's a reasonable uh, anticipation uh, that the Hawaiian Electric companies should be following the so-called inclination papers of uh, two plus years ago yeah, that right. were it's a long written time by already. then Nina Marita, Lorraine, and Mike Champley, right? And Randy Wasik continues to harken back yeah. to those documents, yes, which are a really fascinating read. Yes. So that's the bar. I think that's the yeah. bar that they that was provided to Hawaiian Electric more than two years ago, and the question is how close have they come to the bar? You know, the problem is that however this process is working, when you have a, you know, three, three strikes potentially like this, you're slowing down the process. And if we're really concerned about climate change and all the negatives around fossil fuel, uh, then we've got to move out. You know, 2040 is not that, 2045 is not that far away. And um, we, have to, we have to gain some speed on this. I think we lost time over the next era deal. 
Um, and now we have to start moving again. And uh, it seems like everything you and I have talked about does not necessarily signify moving ahead. Rather, it signifies, uh, you know, um, not moving ahead. And uh, if, if, the, if the, for the third time the PSIP is not approved, it goes back for a further review, revision, rewriting, what have you, and we're going to lose more time. We, I don't think we can afford right. all this time. I think we have to move ahead. That's, that's the, you know, it's, there are serious issues here that have to be resolved on a macro basis. Well, and then you throw in the fact that there's now a rate case, first one in six years, I believe, a rate case pending before the commission for HELCO that uh, is always kind of a, a fraught time. And then the, the big bombshell of news last week with uh, Hu Honua, this group uh, here on our island that is seeking to essentially reanimate the old Pepekeo uh, power plant, which was using coal up until a number of years ago, and uh, use biomass instead, biomass grown here on this island. And uh, just a brief history, I mean, they had a power purchase agreement approved by the commission between Helco and Huho Nua that Helco canceled uh, earlier this year because of uh, lack of performance and not meeting milestones. And there were discussions, this is all public, uh, there were discussions between Helco and Huho Nua to come up with a new deal. And uh, my friend Jay Ignacio at Helco was quoted just last week as saying in the press that they were talking. And then the very next day we get the news that, that Hujo Nua folks filed a, um, a pretty humongous lawsuit in, in U.S. Uh, district court mm. uh, alleging antitrust and suing not only Helco, but suing NextEra, alleging that they uh, essentially collaborated in the in, uh, you know, blasting and canceling the deal uh, inappropriately, illegally, and that they're seeking treble, treble damages, which if, if they were to get, of course, the big if, would total more than a billion dollars of damages. And, I mean, you know, put that in perspective of what Jeff Ono, uh, former consumer advocate, uh, observed at a forum I was at July of last year that the uh, book value of Helco is somewhere in the 700-plus million range. So, I mean, again, this is playing things out. We don't know how it's going to play out in court, but I mean, suing for that amount of money uh, is, is, you know, it's not a way to have a happy Aloha Friday for my friends at Hawaiian Electric. So, I mean, that's, that's the last thing they want to deal with is some uh, unpleasant stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a churning time right now. Yeah. And that, that's another, you know, what I call a distraction. We should be moving ahead and not being distracted. And here we have another a significant distraction for the utility and all of us, which is not really going to move the needle ahead in any way except to suck up our time and resources. Anyway, Marco, uh, it's been great. It's always great to talk to you. I feel, I feel so much better educated now after these few minutes, and I hope we can do this again two weeks hence. And I know there'll be more news, and uh, uh, it'll be in the paper, and it'll be here on ThinkTech. You'll see. That's Marco Mangelsdorf uh, of ProVision Solar and Hilo. Marco and me, sometimes me to Marco and me, on energy every other Monday. Thank you, Marco. You